think we're good to go. Are we good to go? Oh, yeah, I thought there might be a countdown. I can't see a countdown at all. I think there'll be a countdown. Oh, it says live. We're live now. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, my name's Claire Pettinger and I'm chairing this session. And this is Marketplace Session 3. And we've got a couple of really interesting um, Marketplace presentations today. We're going to hear from Sophie Patterson first as part of the Plymouth Food Partnership. And then we are going to be hearing from um, to Dr. Thomas Murphy from the University of Plymouth, and I'll introduce each of those individually, and then we'll get a little bit of an opportunity to ask any questions. Do feel free to um, throw questions into the Q&A while the present presenters are speaking, um, and then we'll try and field those after the event. So we are on quite a, a tight timeline, so um, I think without further ado, we'll get started. So I'd like to warmly welcome Sophie Patterson, who is the um, uh, Sustainable Food Places Coordinator of the Food Plymouth Partnership. And she's going to be sharing some um, insights and information about Food Plymouth. So Sophie, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. That's fantastic. I'm just going to hopefully be bringing my presentation to you in full screen mode. So here we go, I hope. Uh, good morning, everybody. As Claire said, my name is Sophie Patterson and I am the Sustainable Food Places Coordinator with Food Plymouth, which is Plymouth's uh, local food partnership here for the city. So some of you may already have heard a little bit about it if you attended Claire's session earlier on this morning. Uh, but just to recap, and for those of you who, won't there, who weren't there even, um, Food Plymouth represents a diverse mix of agencies, organisations, businesses and community groups, as well as individual citizens who are all com uh, combining their efforts together to actively promote and lobby for healthy, sustainable and affordable food as a driver for positive change. Um, you'll see from our screen that we're a member of the Sustainable Food Places Network, currently holding Bronze Award, which we achieved back in 2015, and we're now currently working towards our Silver Award. And through this, we've got our six key uh, areas of action that we're going to be talking about a little today. I'm going to be giving you a, a whirlwind tour of some of the different projects which are falling under our area of work with the Sustainable Food Places programme. So just a quick bit of background about Sustainable Food Places as well. Um, it's a partnership programme delivered by Sustain Food Matters and the Soil Association. Uh, currently got over 50 Sustainable Food Places in the UK, more coming online all the time. Um, again, I'm going to include some links to that information a little bit later on, uh, but it includes cities like Plymouth, uh, all the way up to Aberdeen, uh, but also at county level as well. So here in Devon, uh, but also in my home county of North Lincolnshire, there's all sorts of different permutations of sustainable food place around the UK right now. So without further ado, I'll take us on our little whirlwind tour. So first up, we have our healthy food for all area of activity. And this photograph here was taken as part of a participatory creative workshop run by the Plymouth Food Equality Project. Um, so this is just one example of the work that's happening around our healthy food for all uh, area of focus. So this particular project is seeking to ensure that we have as many possible diverse voices and experience um, to be included essentially in our future uh, food strategies and priorities. So it's, it's really, really important that uh, projects like this, which uh, Claire uh, is, is leading on here, um, you know, exist so that all of our work is informed by, by people in the city of Plymouth itself. So here's some of the workshops in action as well. Um, of course, uh, these had to be adapted to uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, Lisa Howard, who was running them, was able to do some fantastic online versions, as you can imagine, quite different to the, uh, the practical activities that we can see here, uh, but uh, some really successful results that we could see there. So some of the things they'd be talking about would be the affordability of food, the quality of food, free school meals, for example, and emergency food provision particularly was a topic that we covered during the COVID-19 pandemic as well. So this leads me to our next photo. 
um, which is just some of the plethora of food aid provision which we've seen uh, coming out of Plymouth uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, likewise, uh, as we've seen across the country, Plymouth was not alone in uh, witnessing this huge groundswell base of, of need, but also of community activism and support um, in, in trying to tackle the uh, immediate kind of fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, here in Plymouth, we were very lucky to benefit from a dedicated food aid coordinator, Aisha Cross, who has been working with Food Plymouth and doing brilliant work um, to mobilise and coordinate food aid activity across the city. So that included, as Claire mentioned in her presentation earlier, uh, a fantastic initiative called the Aid Redistribution Centre, um, but also working with long-standing partners in the city as well, such as Devon and Cornwall Feed Action, Fair Share, Love Your Neighbour and others. Of course, I think the important thing to say here is that we know that food aid it itself is just, you know, it's a sticking plaster. Um, and the need for it is both symptomatic and, and complex um, in nature. And so what is absolutely vital uh, to DI alongside is to be able to um, facilitate access to wider support. So here in this photograph, we can see, for example, we've got some of the Healthy Start vouchers uh, information. Um, and also from an environmental perspective as well, the issue of redistribution of, of food, you know, does raise some wider questions as well. Um, this surplus food could be being diverted from landfill, which is, of course, a, a wonderful thing. Um, but, you know, ultimately the question is asked, you know, should we not be working towards eliminating both food insecurity and food waste? Continuing then um, our food waste theme, um, here's an example of uh, a fantastic community project uh, here in Plymouth, uh, the community uh, Generous Earth Community Composting Project. So this is a hot bin composter for those of you who may not have seen one before. Apparently they're absolutely fantastic. Um, and uh, this was a project happening just uh, in the springtime of this year. And uh, it was all about really trying to mobilise a band of composting enthusiasts um, so that they could share their tips, resources and encourage more composting um, in the city. So this was based in Victoria Park. It has support from Snapdragons and funding from Green Mines and the Stronger North Stonehouse team as well. Um, and uh, this is just one example of community action to tackle food waste as part of our Food for the Planet theme. Uh, also looking at our food for the planet theme, um, these little pigs uh, were uh, also helping to combat food waste during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we know, of course, that food waste also occurs on a commercial level, not just at home. Um, so these pigs at Pool Farm, which is Plymouth's community farm, benefited from a partnership with a local brewery who supplied their leftover grain and barley to act as feed for these pigs too. So... And finally, on our Food for the Planet theme as well, we can see um, some of the activities around combating uh, food packaging, particularly plastic uh, food packaging pollution. Um, so the uh, lovely lady who's slightly obscured by her amazing recycled plastic fish costume is local artist Judy Harrington um, on a, on a uh, event which ran on World Environment Day here in Plymouth just recently, uh, organised by Tess Wilmot there on the right hand side and ending up um, having picked up a huge amount of plastic litter along the way at the Green Sheets Eco store in Devonport um, with the lovely Louise there. So uh, just again another example of one of our local activities here in Plymouth around food for the planet. So Events and campaigns, as we've just seen, particularly around plastic pollution, you know, form part of what's our third action area, which is um, building a good food movement. So this is to do with raising public awareness and facilitating and celebrating active food citizenship. And um, one brilliant example of uh, a community initiative working just like this in Plymouth is something called Jar Squad. Um, so this is a project which is exploring the circular economy, barter economy around food preservation, um, bringing people together to preserve food, um, usually using food surplus, food gluts as well, again, linking back into our, our food waste as well. 
Um, so this photo demonstrates their, their trial exchange rates of jar squad currency, which enables anybody who was able to share a little bit of their time or their resources um, to be part of a fantastic community project and hopefully have some lovely jam at the end of it as well. Next up, we've got another community project here, again, focused around uh, food growing. So this is just another example in the city, uh, in the Stonehouse area of Seeds and Feeds, um, which is a community garden growing food, which is able to be um, sold at the talk shop uh, another community have really close by. So I think what we've really seen, particularly in the wake of the COVID pandemic, is a fantastic knitting together of all sorts of different projects um, across the city uh, where you know food may not be you know a central theme, but they're finding lots of different ways to link in with you know cultural projects, arts projects, and community projects across the board. Next up we've got Always Apples, which is an annual uh, apple festival. Um, run by Tess Wilmot, he's part of the Food Plymouth team. Um, it's absolutely jam-packed full of local food, cookery demonstrations, creative art and skill sharing. Um, and for anybody who's ever been part of it, I'm sure you'll uh, agree it's been a, a fantastic um, event to happen every year in Plymouth, including um, a, a much reduced uh, and uh, virtual version and with mini tours during the COVID-19 pandemic as well. So Always Apples is just one of the great examples uh, of, of our good food movement in action here in Plymouth. So having talked about people, having talked about planet, um, we're also going to talk a little bit about the sustainable food economy. Um, so in order to uh, ensure that our food is, is, is sustainably sourced, you know, we're looking at, we're talking about things like, uh, you know, short local supply chains, uh, moving on to look at catering and procurement in a second as well. But here in this photo, again, featuring the lovely Tess, um, we've got her, her cargo bike, um, which featured as part of a recent research and development project here in Plymouth called the Sustenance Partners Project. Um, that brought together um, mutual credit services and colleagues uh, linked into the Open Food Network as well, um, alongside Food Plymouth to explore innovative approaches to strengthening local food economies through improved microeconomic and logistics practices, um, but as well um, a really fantastic programme of community engagement, which is what Tess has been doing here uh, on her mobile mobile research station, complete with a seed bank as well. You can't see it in this photo, but there is actually a, a little seed bank full of um, Stonehouse uh, seeds um, as part of an earlier initiative that they've been involved with. So it was a fantastic way just to try and engage um, local communities to start sharing their thoughts about local food and possibly even growing their own as well. Next, um, we see this lovely photo here in Plymouth Pannier Market uh, around Sustainable Fish, a campaign which ran a couple of years ago. Um, Tess again, Tammy, and also local chef uh, Jacques Marchal as well. So um, when it comes to uh, sustainable food economy, of course, we know that catering and procurement are absolutely key to this. Um, and the key question is, how can we all work together to transform and revitalize our, our local procurement policy? Um, Here's a local campaign in action around sustainable local fish species. Um, but also we're, we're, we're very excited about new developments working with Plymouth City Council around their Resurgum initiative, which is uh, very much championing local procurement. So there's a lot that hopefully can be happening um, here in Plymouth around that soon. Um, equally, um, Speaking about catering, um, here we have the fantastic team behind Cater Ed. Um, Claire again mentioned them in her presentation earlier, but they're a cooperative trading company, um, jointly owned by 67 local schools and Plymouth City Council. Um, they are providing school meals for all of those, and they're prioritising local, regional and organic produce as far as possible within that. Um, so fantastic work going on with Cater Ed. Um, we also see across the city a strong commitment to fair trade as well. Plymouth has fair trade city status too, um, and uh, we can see some really great efforts going on with that, um, including at the University of Plymouth as well. So when we get down to the core of it, um, our final kind of 
and really kind of holding everything together action uh, around our sustainable food places uh, work is an effective strategic and collaborative approach to food governance and strategy this is what is holding it all together uh, in many ways so um, we know that this requires a joined up strategic approach and committed long-term collaboration um, to uh, uh, well everything from community grassroots and third sector organisations to businesses and council leaders. Um, and as we can see in this photo, whilst obviously um, it clearly was taken a, a few years ago now, we perhaps wouldn't be able to have brought people together in this way for a little while. Um, we do bring together our network at regular, uh, regular intervals. So in fact, we have our next partnership and network meeting happening virtually uh, on Zoom on Tuesday the 6th of July and that's an open invitation for anybody who's involved in the food uh, space in and around Plymouth to come along share their news and uh, also explore ways in which we might be able to support and collaborate with one another. So finally um, really a, a call to action for all of you as well what is it that you can do if you'd like to get involved with your local food partnership well if you're here in plymouth here are some uh, details um, in terms of finding us online and contacting us via email um, but equally if you're a little bit further afield in the southwest you'll be pleased to hear that there's a, a food exeter uh, local food partnership as well, most recently a county-wide Devon food partnership um, and also coming soon is a local food partnership in Torbay uh, with conversations in Cornwall and a lot of activity going on there too. If you're elsewhere in the UK then please do visit the Sustainable Food Places website, um, just a link in there for you. Um, there's likely to be one near you but if there isn't um, there are also uh, loads of fantastic resources if you've been inspired to explore possibly establishing a local food partnership where you are too. So that's all for now, I hope I haven't raced through it um, but I'll stop sharing and thanks everybody for listening. Thank you so much, Sophie. That was that was great, and a, a really good and very visual um, outline of some of the excellent work that that food club. So much for that. Um, we've got a couple of um, comments um, in in the chat um, that I'll field at the moment. Um, one is just that says food Plymouth do great stuff, which yeah, I, th <laughs> I think that might be somebody that we know, um, but that's 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 always a good <laughs> a good comment to raise. But an interesting one, and this this may not be something that you can answer. I, I, I've you know it's but but I'll 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 say it anyway. So um, from Rupert, many local authorities have a food waste collection as part of their regular doorstep collection. We don't in Plymouth. Any idea why? Um, and I, I mean, I know that um, the Food Waste Partnership have been trying to tackle this for some time now. But have you heard in your role so far, Sophie, have you had any conversations around that at all? Um, so I, I did. I was actually speaking to Penny the other day, who who is part of the Food Waste Plymouth Food Waste Partnership. Um, so so we're definitely you know keen to collaborate on that. Um, my understanding around why Plymouth doesn't yet have a regular doorstep collection. Um, I think it's something to do with with existing contracts within within the council um, in terms of what's already happening to the waste. So, um, you know, absolutely, if we can build the momentum in the meantime to make sure that when that contract ends, something else can happen that might be a bit more sustainable. I think that's where to focus our energies um, at the moment. Yeah, and I think I think that really aligns nicely with that the strategic approach, isn't it? Where Food Plymouth can help and activities like that that, that that are going on and and supporting through lobbying and 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 that sort of thing. But yeah, I I think Rupert, this has been an ongoing um, issue for some time, and there has been quite a lot of effort put in to try and make that happen. So watch this space. Um, I suppose um, the other thing I I was kind of keen to. Um, to ask you, Sophie, um, I don't, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I just, the, the, there doesn't seem to be another question. So I thought I'd just fill the space. Is about the the kind of silver award. Where, where do we see ourselves as a city? You know, what, what, what do we need to do in order to get to that? Because a few people were asking, there were a few comments about that in, in my previous session. And I suppose, you know, it's thinking collectively, what, what can we do to get to that silver standard of, of the Sustainable Food Places Award, do you think, from your from your 
perspective? Uh, excellent question, Claire. Um, quite, quite a biggie. Um, but for me, I mean, I think there's already so much going on. There's some real strengths, particularly around our healthy food for all activities, around our good food movement. Um, I'd like to see us be able to make some more progress around catering and procurement, around sustainable food economy um, in particular. And I'm also really excited that uh, I think this autumn Sustainable Food Places Network are going to have some funding um, available for specific food and climate related activity as well. So I'm very interested to see what, what we might be able to do there as well. Yeah, that sounds really exciting and really, really pertinent to this particular conference. Mm -hmm. And I know um, some of the work that has been um, the, the, the low carbon Devon project are, are offering internships. And I know that's something that Food Plymouth has been exploring as well to, to, to see how we can and work towards that. Oh, that's that's fantastic. So I think I don't see anything else. Oh, hold on, I've missed one. Um, so somebody, it's it's relating to the. I, I think it's relating to the food waste question. I'm sorry, I I didn't scroll down. Post war, there used to be food waste collection bins on street corners. These were collected and cooked to high temperatures and fed to pigs in the 1990s. Food collected from restaurants was not properly treated and led to foot and mouth outbreak. So now it probably goes to the incinerator. Yeah, I, I, I think at the moment it probably does, but that's kind of backtracking a little bit. Um, so any other questions coming through? I, I think this, I think that might that might draw us nicely to a close, Sophie. But thank you so much for your um, fantastic insights. Um, and if you want to kind of stay stay in the room, I'm going to invite our next speaker up. And we're 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 good for time. So if there are any other food related questions that come in, hopefully you'll be around to answer those. Um, so next, I would like to um, welcome Dr. Thomas Murphy, who is our next speaker. Now, Thomas is an early career researcher interested in the use of nature based solutions. Thomas, I did pinch this from your profile in the university, so I do hope it's current. Um, yep. to tackle local and global environmental issues. And he's going to be talking about trees for climate. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Thomas. So the floor is yours. Um, take it away. Brilliant. Cheers, Claire. So I'll, um, I'll just share my screen. Um, hopefully this is going to work. Uh, So can you give me a, um, let me know if that's coming up. Um, I can see that, that's fine. That's great. Okay, so yeah, thanks Claire for that, um, that introduction. And um, yes, yeah, it's, it's really nice to to speak to uh, you all today. So yeah, I just wanna say thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so yeah, my talk's gonna be called Trees for Climate and Emergency Help Guide. Um, and essentially we're looking at, the talk's gonna be about um, a creative associates project that me um, and my creative partner David Smith from uh, Just Enough Brave um, worked on over the last few months um, and I also want to thank uh, my research uh, colleagues uh, Dr Paul Lunt, Dr McCanley and Dr John S for, for their support in the in the research. So um, I'll just give you a quick background to me just to um, I know Claire's very kindly gave me a nice introduction, but um, I would sort of flesh that out a little bit. So, um, so yeah, like Claire says, I'm a, an early career researcher interested in nature-based solutions. Um, and my PhD was on uh, looking at native woodland establishment for natural flood management. So I worked with the Environment Agency and more trees. Um, I'm also uh, the Green Walls Industrial Research Fellow as part of the Low Carbon Devon Project. Um, and then there's a picture of me in my natural environment <laughs> uh, with a a Mac on and uh, in the rain um, and also um, introduced David Smith. So David is uh, managing director at Just Enough Brave Limited, which is an award winning brand communications agency. So a structure of the talk is very um, briefly going to be um, introduction to a local climate emergency that we have um, in the UK and more specifically as well on, on Dartmoor um, and surrounding areas. And then looking at 
use of trees as a nature-based solution to this this emergency um, and then i'm going to talk very briefly about upland oak woodland um, and its expansion and then i'm going to talk about the work that me and david have been doing to to try and um, address that and to try and see if we can help in any way so um, let's start with the problem so problem one is our climate is changing so um, this is uh, rainfall from uh, Plymouth and Dartmoor so between 1880 and 2012 um, so you can see very clearly this is annual precipitation so you can see there's been big changes in in rainfall in Plymouth but very interestingly a lot more so on Dartmoor um, and, and particularly winter and autumn we see really in, uh, strong increases in precipitation and this is projected to to increase into the future um, but it's very notable that um, these upland areas like Dartmoor are receiving uh, bigger amounts of rainfall. Um, so problem two is that rainfall is got nowhere to go essentially. So many of our upland areas which uh, collect the majority of that rainfall, that's more rainfall that's falling, um, are over compacted. So there was big increases in livestock numbers um, in the 1970s to 2000s but that's left a legacy of over compacted soils which in many areas hasn't gone away so many of our uplands are in poor condition uh, hydraulically so the the water that that increased rainfall is uh, flowing quicker into the streams and causing a, a flood risk for downstream communities um, and that's a, a real big issue a, a climate emergency and, and we can see uh, many areas of the UK have experienced significant flood events like, um, resulting from this, this sort of scenario. Um, so that you can see last year we had Storm Dennis, um, which, you know, ruined many people's lives um, and caused, you know, lots of damage. So, um, you know, economic and social costs can be really significant. So economic costs in their billions um, and then the, uh, the social costs can you know, stay with people for, for years. Um, so closer to home, we've got Buckfast Lee, and there was a flood event in November 2012, um, which uh, which destroyed um, many people's homes. Um, so you can see the picture on the right is a resident uh, who's basically had her home flooded. Um, and then on top of that, she's had David Cameron come and visit. So um, yeah, I, I do feel sorry for her. So uh, yeah, um, so it's one of those things I met this resident and you know it affected her her kids her kids were kids were anxious when they came home from school because they were so worried about the impacts of flooding so it has real consequences uh, this is what a climate emergency looks like um and so can we use trees as a as a nature-based solution so uh, there's lots of hope that we can uh, start to use trees to to better manage that upland catchment. Um, and research that we've done at the university um, over the last couple of years have shown that actually very quickly, when you see um, the planting of trees and, and woodland establishment, you see very big changes in the soil profile. So you can see on the left here, you get bigger increases in the macropores of the soil structure. And this allows the rainfall to infiltrate into the soil quicker, um, meaning that the, end, the water enters the river slower. Um, so, and that can happen very quickly. Um, so we find in our study that native woodland establishment may improve hydrological function of soils within 15 years of establishment. So the picture on your left is one of my sites, which, which we use in our research. Um, and you can see quite clearly in the picture on the, uh, the graph on the right, so you've got the blue uh, line here, which shows your infiltration in, uh, of water in the woodland areas um, is much higher Generally, there's site variation, but you see uh, much higher than than your pasture pasture sites. So we know it can make a, a significant difference in, in a relatively you know, modest time frame. Um, but you know, native woodland creation can do more than just uh, potentially mitigate flood risk. Actually, they can provide the multiple benefits that we need to to tackle this this emergency. So you've got this carbon sequestration benefits. Um, it can be a you know significant um, uh, you know, uh, part of our of our uh, our, um, our strategy to to reach net zero, um, it can provide jobs and employment. Um, you've got the nature conservation um, resilience that's offered by 
a native woodland. Um, you've got the benefits to mental health and well-being. Um, and then you've got reconnecting people to their natural and cultural her heritage, um, which is um, is really needed. Um, and the UK is one of the least wooded countries in Europe. So we've only got 13% tree cover. Um, and it's recommended that 30,000 hectares of new woodland are needed each year in the UK to mitigate climate changes and reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. So to put that in context, 30,000 hectares is roughly, um, I think it's a, a, basically a few times the size of Bristol. I remember looking this up. So it's a, it's a significant area. Um, but, you know, that's the challenge that, that, we're, that we're tasked with. Um, and upland as a native woodland, upland oak woodland is a real um, special case. So these are our temperate rainforests. So um, these are located in north and western areas of the UK. Um, and these are really globally significant uh, rainforests. So they are actually technically rainforests um, and they support really significant populations of, of rare bryophytes and lichens. Um, also UK native trees, which, which dominate these woodlands in our upland areas, um, they support 2,300 species, so more than any other uh, trees, native tree species. And they're all also long-term stores of carbon, so oak trees can live for potentially thousands of years. Um, but, you know, there's just 70 to 100,000 hectares um, remaining, um, and they're fragmented. So we have a real issue on our hands. Um, so some of the research we've been conducting is looking at how can we um, expand upland oak woodland for this climate mitigation. Um, so we looked at the nat natural establishment of oak woodlands and we use this to make management recommendations for establishment into upland pastures where they're needed for this, this climate mitigation. Um, and understanding this is really important. Um, understanding where and when we can rely on, on estab natural establishment of trees is really important for understanding the cost um, and also the environmental sensitivity um, and the, you know, maximizing the benefits of native woodland establishment. So here's a picture on the right from, from Dartmoor, uh, seeing a, an oak sapling uh, establishing. So the next task, I suppose, is actually communicating it. And that's a really, really key thing. So I'm just going to read this quote from Professor Johan Rockstrom. So he says, the next decade is the decisive decade. Our actions will decide the fate of humanity on planet Earth. So that sort of a very polemic statement is can be, you know, very anxious, you know, anxiety uh, creating. And, you know, actually, we need to help people. So, you know, let's make it easy for people to take informed action um, and po positive action. Um, um because it it is a um it's a challenge and uh, um we need we need solutions so our, our project um trees for climate and emergency help guide was essentially about um trying to communicate these these recommendations um, so we wanted to offer clear concise management recommendations to encourage natural uh, regeneration of oak woodlands whilst providing uh, advice for sensitive planting of native trees. Um, and we wanted to use various communication tools um, and partner organisations to disseminate this research. We also wanted to link uh, individuals and stakeholders wanting to take action on the climate emergency uh, using the uh, native woodland methods um, with organisations that could provide uh, advice and support so they can get involved, essentially. Um, so we had... A range of communication tools uh, which were uh, put together with me and David um, so David's expertise on this was really uh, invaluable um, so we created a, an animated video which which uh, basically tries to engage the audience in in this this climate emergency um, um, and this is accessible by YouTube and a dedicated microsite we also have this microsite which is a uh, 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 www.treesforclimatenow.com and this gives an overview of the research and, and tries to drive users to our project partners um, who can help implement and support some of their native woodland expansion uh, projects. Um, and also we have infographics and social graphics to, to, to really help communicate them uh, these this research and really visually digestible information um, so it's useful. Um, and then we have our white paper. So this is going to be a sort of visually engaging um, using photography and infographics to really 
communicate those recommendations. Um, and these are going to be distributed to key stakeholders via our project partners. Um, so you can see here on the right, we've got an example of our infographics and then uh, our website where uh, we, we're directing people to organizations that we can really uh, help them out and that, where they can get involved. So I'm just going to hopefully this will play. This is our animation that was created uh, by David and um, um, as part of our project. So it's a short one, but oh, that hasn't worked. Um, anyway, the, the, that, that's keeping you in uh, in suspense. So go and check it out on the website. But um, I just want to say um, anyway, thanks to um, our project partners. So Low Carbon Devon, um, ERDF. Um, um, and University of Plymouth Sustainable Earth Institute. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, More Trees, uh, Future Forest Network, and the UK Environment Agency, who have again have, uh, funded and, and helped um, partner this project. Um, so, anyway, so, um, so if you can, I just want to say, yeah, thank you for listening. Um, and if I look forward to the questions, and um, yeah, if you want to find out more, then please visit our website. Um, they'll have the, the video on there. So, um, yeah, um, yeah, I think that's it for me. Um, Oh, th thank you, Thomas. Can we try the video again, or is it? Is it, I, I don't want to take up too much precious question time, but it, it's yeah. a shame that didn't play. I, I try it I, again. I didn't That's labour it. Should we? Should we try it again and see if? Yeah. It, oh. Always oh, doing good. Carbon net zero by twenty fifty will require the creation of thirty thousand hectares of new woodland a year. The expansion of oak woodlands in the UK's uplands could be critical in helping reduce the impacts of climate change. These important temperate rainforests have been historically degraded and are now highly fragmented. But their expansion can reduce flood risk, increase biodiversity and help remove carbon from the atmosphere. If you'd like to play your part in tackling the climate emergency, then the strategic planting of native trees and encouraging natural woodland regeneration could be the perfect way. To find out who can help you, how to get involved, and to read more about our research, please visit our website. Brilliant. Well, that's, oh. So, that's it. Fantastic. Oh, really, really well done. That was fascinating, Thomas. I re really, really enjoyed hearing about that. Um, and right. the Creative Associates Award is such a great opportunity to, to, to share your research in an accessible way. So well done there. I was fascinated by the, um, I didn't even realise that the UK had such a low percentage of tree cover in Europe. I, I'm, I'm quite shocked mm. by that, but not, not surprised. But yeah, it, the, the, the actual percentage um, shocked me slightly. Um, we have got a few um, <clears throat> comments and questions coming in, um, so I'll just work my way through those. Some of them are more kind of comments, um, yep. some are more focused to questions, so I'll try and read these out. Um, yep. So one anonymous, the, the 8 billion angels film commented that the West having plundered poorer countries should stop pointing the finger at them now. We deforested Cornwall and Devon for timber for ships, I believe. Should we not now reforest them? Well, yeah, I, I suppose that's um, that is a telling point. Um, I mean, my argument would is I suppose it's, um, it's it's getting the balance right in terms of we should be definitely expanding our woodland uh, cover. I mean, it's um, it does seem a bit rich, doesn't it? Lecturing other people on on deforestation you know there's a lot of talk about the amazon disappearing and essentially we've lost our amazon you know a long time ago um so yeah i think that that has a lot of credence i think um yeah yeah okay great so there's another comment this woodland restoration tie-in with peatland restoration Dartmoor. um oh sorry <laughs> sorry that was my um timer going off Oh, okay. um, we've got loads of time okay. there's, there's no pressure at all recent environment agency report said that woodland was quicker at capturing carbon but peatland stored a greater mass of carbon over a longer time scale yeah i mean that's um i think when you're talking about these strategies i think um it's uh it shouldn't be either or so actually there's a there's a nuance so peatlands do absorb a lot of, of carbon they store it um, for a, a very long time, um, 
but often it's I suppose um, it's it's getting the right trees in the right place. So that's a it's a it's a, a very well used uh, an increasingly used phrase, but I think it is actually true. Um, so you know our peatlands on Dartmoor. Um, what we want to do is is plant on them because actually that can reduce that uh, store. And actually, um, if you do you know, like you're saying, if you do get the right trees in the right place. Um, we can make quite a big, significant difference um, quite quickly. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's getting the balance right. Really, you know, we want, we want both. We want. I, it'd be great if we can have our peatlands restored and our native woodlands restored. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, as as a as a national park, then I, I think that's what Dartmoor should be and our, our national park should be doing you know. yeah yeah excellent um so there's another another um comment question here um with with the trees that we plant now not to not taking carbon up until the 2030s can we start campaigning for much more land going into organic conversion now to do with heavy lifting for the first 10 years when soil organic matter has reached its max the trees will take over yeah um yeah i'd like to um have a bit more time to think about that but yeah i mean evidence does show that you know um trees can quite quickly um start the work of so the first 30 years of, of native woodland establishment or woodland establishment are probably the most productive um so yeah i definitely think there's a, a role in um in our improving our soils i think uh soils are a sort of a critical and, and um, very underappreciated um, part of our of uh, a carbon reduction strategy. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely. Um, I think um, yeah, it sounds like a good suggestion. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, there's some. I mean, interesting comments coming through here. We've got another yeah. comment um, from somebody suggesting that how about making our natural parks truly natural like the American types and pay farmers to help do this by moving away from grazing and livestock. I mean, that's more of more of a comment. And I know it's difficult for you kind of um, kind of being put in, put in the spot here, Thomas, with lots of. Um, now it's really interesting. It's, it's always yeah, good. That, I think that's a fascinating debate, actually, because, uh, you know, our, our national parks are very different in a lot of ways to, to the, the American model, um, you know, obviously through, uh, you know, our geography and our situation is quite different. So I don't know if we could really recreate something on the scale of, of what they can do in the United States and, and, and North America. But um, I think there's definitely a role of um, um, that interesting, that paying farmers to, uh, to sort of manage the land in a, in a more environmentally um, sensitive and uh, I suppose uh, role is could work, but it it's tricky actually because there there's something very deep within farming and farmers' uh, connection to to their livelihood that um, is quite difficult to shift actually. So I think it's a it'd be great if we can. Um, encourage um, farmers to, to manage the land um, and moving and we can pay them to, to offer those those services those those land management services for for, for climate change but um, I think there still has to be some sort of heavy lifting on and actually what understanding the cultural ties to that farms have to grazing and, and livestock um, I think it's yeah it could, it's potentially very tricky and it has to be done very sensitively or you could end up with a situation like we had in you know the 1980s with coal mining where lots of people don't feel like they're part of a change to a for a different approach so yeah that's really yeah and, and I suppose that that links up with 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 the discussion we had earlier around food and the food system and 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 how there needs to be dietary change and how that affects farming and, and agriculture etc so so yeah there's mm -hmm. some real sensitivities there really aren't there um that's someone it. else is asking what what to define a natural park though we don't really know what how, how that's defined um 
I like it. Somebody's saying that the Forest Beef team and the Devon Somerset border have been doing some great work along these lines. Uh, somebody else has said bamboo apparently locks up carbon, particularly if buried. Um, there's a comment here asking whether you've met any Dartmoor commoners who love the idea of more woodland. No, well, that's, yeah, I mean, it's, a, in, I have met Dartmoor commoners who like woodland um, and and can see actually a place for woodland. Um, it's just, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of um, animosity and um, what's the word? Um, I suppose silo thinking where where we're we're all in our little um, bubbles and it's quite easy to to um have in impressions of what other people think um so that i think commoners are rightly sort of um in some ways a bit fearful because they're they're sort of thinking well you know this, these people are sort of threatening my 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 way of life my culture um but um, so there's a lot of understanding that that needs to happen. But I, but um, I think ultimately we have to think about the sort of broader societal public goods. And um, if we can, if we can, I think money talks. You know, if we can pay people um, to to change their behaviour, then then hopefully that would make a difference. Um, mm, that's an interesting concept, yeah. <laughs> There's some work going on to rewild certain era, areas of Dartmoor, is is the final comment in the box there, um, which, which yeah, I don't know if you've got any response to that, Thomas. It kind of takes us up to midday. And... Yeah, I mean, rewilding is a really interesting one. Um, I think, um, yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely um, efforts to, to, to rewild. I don't know how... Um, I mean, rewilding is sort of a uh, can be a bit of a catch or it can mean different things to different people. Um, so there, there are definitely efforts and, and understanding what that means um, for people on Dartmoor, I think, is is a really um, challenging one because, um, uh, yeah, um, I think um, if we're not careful, it could be um, a bit of a um it could be divisive when actually it doesn't need to be i think we need to have a lot more cross communication between different parts of society so we can understand each other a bit better but uh, there, there definitely needs to be a um a changed approach because evidence shows that our natural environment is is failing um and our approach so far has failed so we need to yeah and, and i think i mean that's certainly from from my expertise around food and the food system we know that that's the case so there's there's real kind of um synergies there and somebody a final point here oh, there may be more points coming in there needs to be we need to is there a need to recognize diversity of practices in farming um yeah i i i think i would tend tend to agree with that. I don't know if, I mean, farming's come into it here. It could apply to what you're saying about understanding diversity and understanding different people have different um, um, agendas and cultures yeah. and, and et cetera. And there might be a place for both, actually. You know, actually, you know, we need to, we all live on this planet and we all live, um, we all make use of these areas. So, you know, um, that it's trying to reduce these, um, yeah, trying to recognise that. I think people are a lot more open-minded than you realise when you get to speaking to people. Yeah, absolutely. And I know earlier when I was with um, Sarah Bridal, we were talking about the need to kind of put citizens at, at the heart of, of some of the decision making that needs to happen. Um, and I really liked your strap line, let's make it easier for people to take informed action. I think um, that, that's what it's all about to me as an academic, sim similar to you. It, it's it's all very well us having ideas and numbers and lots of stats and facts and figures. But in fact, we need to we need to um, support and enable that change on the ground. Um, there's a final comment here from Ian Smith um, in relation to the Dartmoor commoner. One, one commoner I speak to regularly is really keen to get back to relatively light year-round grazing on the moor to control certain grasses and be better for the health and well-being of the hardy animals, which do not always do well being kept close together in sheds, barns during the winter months. Um, so, yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. I mean, again, 
trees can actually it doesn't have to be raw and actually rewilding and, and woodland establishment can be good for for, for livestock so it's mm. um you know there's benefits for both parties potentially it's just um yeah yeah, yeah that is really interesting yeah i think there's yeah, a lot no. more flexibility yeah um, fascinating um thomas thank you so much and um, we're, we're we're kind of on our time limit now but we are going into lunch now so there is a little bit of a break i don't know if i might i don't know if i'm allowed to do this to bring sophie sophie back in just to um see if anybody else might have any other questions for sophie around around the food plymouth theme there were a few more follow-on conversations that were being interspersed around the the, the anaerobic digester and and and, and food waste etc um, but i think we've had a really useful discussion here and and thank you both sophie and thomas for i've certainly learned a lot um i mean i knew quite a lot about food plymouth anyway but thomas you've enlightened me quite considerably and i'm i'm, I'm quite keen to, to 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 read a little bit more about your creative associates award so thank you both for um, for your efforts and I believe we're going into lunch now so um, lunch and networking I believe so um, thank you everyone and we'll see you all shortly thank you thanks everyone good to see you all I'm not sure what happens now <laughs>